New developments in the 38 Studios oversight, and there's a lot to oversee. Welcome into my state of mind. I am Dan York. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you aboard. Weeknight, 7.30, 11.30 on IRI TV, and a super growing audience on Fox Providence at midnight. Thanks for watching. Karen Macbeth is my guest tonight. She's the state representative from Cumberland, a principal by trade, an educator who now is running oversight. And I think doing an admirable job of it, but this system is just not set up, in my humble judgment, for the right kind of process, although she's picking apart, it's kind of like picking at the Thanksgiving turkey. You know, there's still some good meat on that bone, and that's what she's doing. In fact, tonight, she will tell us about a new development, new documentation that sheds even more negative new light on what was going on with the 38 Studios saga. So do not go anywhere. Let us go to the uh, rundown for just a couple of quick notes. Notice I have a few th items here because I got so much time that I want to spend with Karen, but I really wanted to get in to this Paw Sox situation, if we could. If we could run the headline, Larry Lachino slowing Paw Sox move. Charles Steinberg, the new boss, says he wants to see passion again in Pawtucket. Here's the package that uh, I went into ran, and we'll talk about it. Here's the new leadership team of the Pawtucket Red Sox. Their biggest challenge, attendance. We have work to do to get people back here. Uh, we have formidable challenges ahead of us, um, but great opportunities. The overall theme of the news conference, getting fans back to McCoy. We obtained this attendance chart from International League showing the declined attendance at McCoy. In fact, 2014 was the lowest attendance total since the stadium was remodeled in 1999. We have a repair job to do here. There's work to be done. There is a, um, uh, there, there were wounds that were suffered by fans here last year. Some of those wounds inflicted by the team's pitch to build a new stadium on the waterfront in Providence. With that shot down, they're now hearing plans from multiple cities, even reopening talks with Pawtucket to renovate McCoy for 60 plus million dollars. Step back and uh, take whatever proposals, uh, suggestions, uh, plans, presented to us and take the time to do some uh, due diligence. And as those talks are slowed down, the main focus for this team is filling the seats. Which they're not going to do. Good report by Steve. Uh, they're not going to do. Y you can't tentatively date somebody. As Tim Britton from the Providence Journal wrote in his sports piece today, I think pretty eloquently, it's kind of a marriage of convenience now where the husband and the wife are sticking around simply because of the kids. You want to repair the relationship here in Rhode Island, Dr. Steinberg? Say you're not going anywhere. Pretty doggone simple. Say, look, we're committed to Rhode Island. And whether we got to renovate McCoy or whether we got a good opportunity to go downtown into Providence, well, that's an iffy thing. Look, this has been one of the biggest screw ups between an organization that is way too cocky for its own well good, that's the Paw Sox. Uh, and a void of leadership in the state of Rhode Island, which has never been more apparent. So people were upset about two things. Yeah, some people don't like the idea that you'd leave McCoy, but they didn't like the idea that you want a $4 million net per year for 30 years to finance a stadium. They didn't like that idea. Nobody liked that idea. So we never saw what the second ask was because for some reason that busted up behind uh, the scenes. Springfield, Worcester, and Fall River are all going to get competitive for your franchise to come to those cities. When you tell us that you're not interested in those suitors, then people will come back to McCoy this season. But we've got five years left on the deal, and frankly, your attendance is going to stink until you say, we're Rhode Island through and through. It's as simple as that. Not any more complicated. And we're not stupid. So if you don't say it, we get that. Come on in, we'll talk about it. We're gonna invite the Paw Sox brass because they want a new start. Well, looking forward to having a good conversation with them here. Uh, PC is number one in hockey. Now you, won't, you know they won the national championship, but that reached the, that was kind of on the come last year. But uh, here's your headline celebrating this. This is great stuff. So. Let's just not forget that PC is not all about basketball. We have the number one ranked hockey franchise in the nation right now. And we congratulate them for that. And uh, lastly, it is the, what, 240th anniversary of the Marines? That's a big deal. Congratulations to this fine military organization. You know, I never, I never, 
uh, served our country in uniform and feel inadequate because of it. And I will tell you, whenever I meet a Marine, there's just a special thing that comes with the whole package. You know, I'm not qualified to say it, but congratulations and Semper Fi. All righty, we are going to accelerate the rest of the program here tonight because I, I want to get into some things. So here's, uh, here's headline number one uh, that kind of restarted the whole conversation on 38 Studios, and there is the tough-looking chairperson of the Oversight Committee. And then headline number two, after just a couple of meetings, was a little bit of a bomb drop by the chairperson who said, hey, look at this story. And so we pick it up from there. Returning to the show is Karen Macbeth. Welcome. Thank you. It is nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, in, in the couple of minutes that we have in this segment, rather than me getting after you, because people who listen on the radio on WPRO and have seen my commentary here know that I'm unhappy with the entire setup. Tell me about what you think the value of the new oversight stuff has brought to the table so far and what confidence you have that what you're doing matters. Oh, I have complete confidence that what we're doing does matter. I mean, the end result certainly will be legislation moving forward to protect us from not having this happen again. But I think so far we've taken information from the depositions and we've dug deeper and we're getting answers for the people. And that's another part of this. It's not just passing legislation, it's rebuilding the trust. The legislature has to rebuild the trust with its members because we were lied to on the House floor and we have to rebuild the trust with the people of the state and I feel one way to do that is to make sure they have the answers as we move forward and that's what I'm trying to do. All right. Um, well, I, I might as well just get into this because, because it's going to be a conversation where you and I probably either won't, won't, either, either won't agree or we won't come to a resolution because you've got some breaking news and some kind of breaking aspect to this uh, today that I want to get into and it was last week's saga that really caused me to say get Karen in here. Here's my thing. I, I don't see enough stature, setup, drama in these hearings to make this feel like state government of any kind, any branch, is literally determined to get to the bottom of what happened, hold those accountable either criminally or politically, uh, learn the lessons and rebuild in, the, in a way that really gives the state, forgive the term, a political enema so that we can get this cloud past us and move forward. Where's the urgency? You've run a couple of hearings a week apart. Say, so yeah, I'll see you Tuesday at 4.30 in the afternoon. Run on Capitol Television. Maybe you catch it, maybe you don't. I mean, there's enough damage to the state to say, hey, we got a months long series of hearings minimally. They're going to run every night, bang, bang, bang in prime time. We're going to bring independent lawyers in here who are going to help us interrogate. We're going to subpoena every legislator who voted on this and the dozens more people who are tangentially involved in this whole thing. We're going to do this a big time right way. Instead, you're like a you're like a voice in the wilderness trying to run a legitimate hearing with 15 people or 11 people behind you going blah, 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 and a couple of documents that are being passed around and nobody knows what the hell is going on. That's my complaint about the process. So how do, how do you react to that? You're looking at me like you want to die. I know. But I mean, how do you react to, to what I and other people think is a really half effort at best? Well, I think certainly my role in the committee isn't half effort, but I completely. I don't want you to take this personally. Oh no, it's not personal. Because if not for you, what else would we? What would we do? So please understand that the conversation's in that context. Thank you, and I'm not going to disagree. There could be other avenues that other state officials do take. Um, there's the big push out there for the independent investigation, and I said go ahead, but I'm not in charge of that, and. That's up to our governor if she chooses to do that. And if she's not, I have to continue just doing what I can do. Um, you have the attorney general. I asked in our last oversight for him to start investigating. If he chooses to, then he does. But if he doesn't, I'm not going to let that hold me back. I'm going to continue. And if it's But what have your conversations been with the Speaker of the House? I mean, I, I've been given a real rough time in the last three weeks for, the, for this reason. 
this thing started in the house, and he always says he knew nothing about it, whatever. Well, if he knew nothing about it, whatever, and there was nobody to protect, or there weren't players that wanted protection, if not for this saga, things that relate to this kind of a saga, meaning the lobbyists who really like the way things go, and if the system of 38 Studios is exposed, the lobby system gets exposed. He's protecting somebody, maybe not his own role in 38 Studios, or lack thereof, but he's protecting a status quo environment. If he wanted to do it right, he'd say, Karen, issue a subpoena to anybody you want to, I'll sign it. Get everybody in and have them accountable. What they knew, how they knew it, what did they know on the night that, 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 that the vote came down. Go chase Stephen Constantino, the former uh, guy, uh, uh, finance chairman who lied to you on the floor in Vermont. Let's get Gordon Fox out of jail. Let's get Kurt Schilling here. Let's get Michael Corso, the broker. We'll talk about that next. Let's get everybody in. And by the way, you're a good egg and you're doing a good job, but you're not qualified to interrogate him. Let's get a lawyer of your choice in here to do that work. I mean, why isn't that happening? Have you talked to him about it's this? It's not that it's not happening. And we have talked about it. And we began with the letters to Kurt Schilling. And he hasn't responded, so we will but be following set up that a up system with a subpoena. Of, why haven't you subpoenaed everybody who voted for this thing? Do we really believe as citizens that only two people knew that this thing was in the hopper? Well, I sat on the House floor, and you watched as I questioned, and you, uh, well, you've seen the tapes. I believe that you didn't know. And, uh, Do you believe that only two people in the House knew that this deal was in the hopper with the EDC when that loan guarantee program was approved by the General Assembly? I certainly don't think the, the regular members knew that. Um, I mean, certainly, and, to, and the way I see it is Billy Murphy, Speaker Murphy, was part of those initial meetings where he went and he went to the function. And then when you look at the depositions, he's out of it. And you have that meeting that took place with Speaker Fox in his office that Billy Murphy walked into, and then he was gone. That was it. And, and you see over and over in all the depositions that you have Constantino and you have Fox and you have Corso, Corso who didn't register as a lobbyist. So you have all these lobbyists doing what they're supposed to and following the law. And you have Corso coming and making millions because he's not registering as a lobbyist. So I certainly think that there were members that knew. We, we had Fox, we had Constantino, but besides that, those were the key players. Has the Speaker of the House told you you can't do something? Absolutely not. Everything you want to do, you've been able to do. Yes. So then why aren't you asking for big time professionalism? Go ahead and spend a couple of million dollars if you have to in taxpayer money to get this thing done right, rather than meeting every other Tuesday or Thursday at 4 o'clock whenever you guys can get together. It's like a club. The House Oversight Committee feels like a club to me, as opposed to an investigative body. Well, it's a club that certainly I'm getting more information out there than others, and I'm not going to disagree that there couldn't be a whole different body doing this, but that's where I am right now, and if it I gets think to it the has point... Needed, I don't think it needs to be a whole different body. It needs to... The, the, the execution of, of... I knew we wouldn't get anywhere. Okay, so... When we come back, there are two conversations that Karen has been able to generate that are worthy of discussion, and I quit. We'll be right back. All righty, so there you see the scene uh, where the hearings take place. There have been two, since the 38 Studios hearings restarted. And by the way, folks, I know when we start talking about the middle of the sandwich in these stories, you're like, what? But please just try to pay attention and do as much research on 38 as you can. If I reset the whole story, remember, this is all about Kurt Schilling's failed $75 million program. There was a loan guarantee that the legislature passed in uh, May of 2010 that, uh, that provided uh, $75 million, well, $125 million of, of, of alleged available money, 75 of which went to Kurt Schilling. It had been turned down twice prior by the leg legislature, and of course it all came back when uh, the deal makers had this thing in, 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 in you know, their back pocket, and the legislator, legislators voted and the governor signed the loan guarantee program, which helped to fund all the projects that would come from it, which was really only about 38 studios. And we know the deal went bust, and now we owe $100 million cumulatively in principal and interest, and everybody wants to know what happened, how, and uh, uh, Karen McBeth is the chairperson of the 38 Studios Oversight Committee, which had its early start with paper pushing, and now since the depositions uh, from the civil lawsuit where the state is looking to recover money have been uncovered, and you've seen all the news coverage of that, we have more stuff. Now, here's the headline that we were talking about 
really briefly. Um, uh, okay, so that was that was that one. Okay, the success fee, right? Thirty-eight studios, Corso success fee. This Michael Corso put his picture up. Good-looking guy. Do uh, you think he's a villain? Absolutely. What did what bomb did you try to listen? The, what you did last week was just to accumulate information that was made available through the civil litigation. Right. What was it that you were trying to say about Michael Corso and his incentive program last week? So I was, his, what you were what saying I, last week. What I was week. trying to say is that he didn't register as a lobbyist. He collected a, sec, a success fee of over two million dollars. It was supposed to be three point seven five. Had he registered as a lobbyist, that would have had to have gone on the form that he filled out as a lobbyist. Then we would have been alerted. We have a lobbyist making three point seven five million or two million on this deal that we don't even know what's going on, and that would have been a red flag certainly to. Um, who was ever in charge at that time, uh, higher up, and then also to us on the floor before we voted. He chose not to register as a lobbyist because he knew, or I believe he knew he was, would be breaking the law. He was investigated by the Secretary of State in the middle of the Lieutenant Governor election. Ralph Mollis, the Secretary of State, was running against Dan McKee for Lieutenant Governor and then started to try to draw him in and he got slapped down by the courts. Um, that was messy. So Corso was attempted to be brought in, in for accountability, but that was a mess. And the current Secretary of State doesn't seem to have any interest in him right now. Uh, so That's so, unfortunate. Okay, so you last week said, help! You literally want to, State Police, Attorney General, please investigate this. Right. Have you heard back from them? I've spoke with the State Police, the Colonel of the State Police, and they have the documents. Of course, at this point, he won't share where they're at, but he says he's aware of it, and that also he um, is getting a transcribed version along with um, the regular television version of the Oversight Committee the, hearing. The Attorney General, did he respond to your... He had a staff member leave a voice message for me. And Which said what? It just said that he was returning my phone call, but I asked to speak to the Attorney General, so... Did you... I mean, well, you made a public proclamation that you want them to investigate. Did they publicly mm -hmm. respond to you in any way, shape, or form? No. The Attorney General voted on the Loan Guarantee Program as a member just like you. Yes, he did. Don't you think he ought to just get the hell out of the way and recuse himself? I would think so, but he thinks otherwise at this point. It's at least continue with the investigation. What do you? What, what does your gut tell you that Michael Corso should suffer? Financially to begin with, give back what he took from the state. He, the monies that he was paid came from the loan guarantee program. Yes, which was on our on the backs of the taxpayers. Okay. When we come back, there's another thing that Mr. Corso was involved with. Karen just came up with some new documentation and a new finding that's worth even more money. Stay with us. Now, know that when it comes to 38 Studios and the way the committee is going about business, with all due respect to its chairperson, I don't think they're doing a good job, and it's not about her, it's about the Speaker of the House setting up the right kind of system. Having said that, Representative McMath made uh, a dramatic point about the deal maker, one of them at least, in 38 Studios, Michael Corso. We talked about that in the last segment, there he is, uh, and the money that he took without registering as a lobbyist that came from the proceeds of the Loan Guarantee Program. That's strike one. So, as I'm talking about these sagas, know that I do it kind of like in protest, like you play the game, but I, I protest the way this whole process has been going. Yet, in the middle of a protest game, there are plays that are made, and they're important. And I think you've, put, you've picked up another one. I don't know, Laura, I don't know where you want to go with this, for the camera, which, which camera, how about that camera? This is a document, sorry, Karen, I'm That's very okay. rude. I mean, it's, it's just trying to, Karen's rolling with the punches here. Anyway, just take a shot of that. Do you want to go to that camera, or you don't? Yeah. Uh, you're going to hit? Uh, just, just, you don't have to center in too far. Okay, there's a whole document here, and what's in orange is what I'm going to read to you. This is, Karen, help me with this. This is a document from Brookline Bank Corp, which recently acquired Bank Rhode Island, correct? Yes. And it's a, a report to the SEC, Their correct? quarterly report, yes. Where did you get this? 
Um, it was sent to me um, because on the, during the last oversight hearing, I said that I would be researching. I wanted all the banks, all the information, who was involved, and um, this happened to come to me from a, a so source. This document I'm holding is not part of the document drop in the civil litigation, correct? Not that we found, no. Okay. It reads. Uh, this is a report to the SEC about losses that the uh, Brookline Bank Corp has, and it talks about uh, a $4.2 million problem uh, booked in connection with two short-term commercial loans immediately after acquisition by the company's subsidiary, Bank Rhode Island. These loans were based in part on the issuance of tax credits, which, due to the unexpected and abrupt bankruptcy filing of an entity in Rhode Island related to the borrowers, were not issued bankruptcy would be 38 studios. The company has moved aggressively to resolve the problem credits and is evaluating all potential sources of recovery. However, further recovery attempts will be complicated and subject to additional discussions with the relevant parties, including the state of Rhode Island. This is Bank Corp, Brookline Bank Corp, reporting to the SEC about acquisition problems and a mess they've got to clean up with Bank Rhode Island. Yes. Bank Rhode Island did what, according to your investigation? In, it's so far, we've been able to determine that there were two loans to Mike Corso, um, where he was pledging that he was going to get tax credits and that he needed these loans to bridge till he got the tax credits. Tax credits on behalf of the 38 Studios project? Yes. In part because Kurt Schilling didn't get all the money that he thought he would. Of the $75 million appropriated for the project, 20 plus billion dollars was held back for reserve interest all that kind of stuff and Schilling right. wasn't happy right so what is do, so do you know whether Corso provided collateral for the loans that he got from Bank Rhode Island we've been able to t determine that Kurt Schilling did put some gold coins towards this but no, whatever the collateral is that we've found so far isn't enough to cover the loans so we go back to like banking crisis issues where you have loans that aren't being covered and you, you have a local bank at the time, Bank Rhode Island, issuing these and from what I understand, the uh, biggest shareholder, Buff Chase, um, was friends with Mike Corso and Mike Corso also had his restaurant in one of Buff Chase's buildings. Um, so they knew each other, the loan was made and now we well, have a well, four million dollar loss on the books. Okay, I can't yeah, you, you, you're allowed to say what you want here. I can't make any representations that Mr. Chase has any uh, legal or liability issues. Um, nor can I make any representations here that Mr. Corso does. But what's apparent here, it seems to me, is that there were some loose finances going on. Yes. And so what is the House Oversight Chairman going to do in 30 seconds about this? So what I've done so far is once I have the document, I've contacted the SEC and uh, spoke with it through emails and then spoke to them on the phone um, today with my concerns. And they're going to follow up. And I have a formal letter that I'm signing this evening that's going to be sent to them uh, with my concerns here. And then we've requested all the documents from uh, Brookline Bank Corps regarding this, the documents of the loans. Okay. In 10 seconds, what does it smell like to you? Dirty. Why? Five seconds. D giving loans that shouldn't have been given on tax credits you were never going to get. Got it. We'll wrap up when we come back. We'll follow up on this banking story tomorrow on the radio at noon on WPRO and, of course, back here tomorrow night and anybody who's been mentioned on this program has the perfect right to come in and say hey listen here's my version of whatever story you're talking about you have a good night thanks for watching